Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Amy Glocky, uh, an associate professor in Africana Studies, and I am really excited. So I know this is my uh, intro to Black Studies and Black Culture class. Um, in addition to uh, a lot of guests who are here to um, have this amazing experience with us. So I am going to introduce my amazing colleague, Dr. Stanford, and she's going to uh, uh, let you know what's happening today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Glocke, for allowing us to come into your class and talk about this very important topic. And welcome to everyone to the Black Power Hour. My name is Dr. Karen Stanford, and I am a professor in Africana Studies. Joining me in moderating this conversation is Keith Rice, who's the historian and archivist for the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center. Also present is Zena Munoz, an archival assistant for the Tom and Ethel, Ethel Bradley Center, and she will be supporting us with technology today. Our guest today is Bernard Arafat. Before introducing him, I'd like to tell you about the purpose of the Black Power Hour, which is to provide students with the opportunity to learn about the historical Black Power era in Los Angeles by presenting conversations with former activists in university classrooms. In general, the Black Power movement is distinguished from the civil rights movement by its rejection of integration as a primary goal of political activism and its defense of self-defense as necessary to the survival of Black people. And our hope is that these conversations can open up an intergenerational dialogue with young people today who are concerned with such issues as the prison industrial complex, police brutality, climate change, poverty, immigration, and structural racism. Now, in terms of our agenda for today, we will begin with an introduction and hold a conversation with our guests lasting about 20 minutes or so. And the remaining time will allow for students and others to join the conversation. So Keith Rice will introduce Bernard Arafat. Thank you, Dr. Stanford. Hello, everyone. Bernard, Bernard Arafat is a Crenshaw High School student activist. He's a member of the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And he participated in defending the Black Panther headquarters, headquarters on 41st and Central against the 300 member attack by the LAPD SWAT team. But before we start our interview with Mr. Arafat, we're gonna play a little video clip of that event. And we'd also like to showcase a photo of Bernard Arafat during that time period. That's, That's you, me. right? That's me, yeah. And how old were you in that photo, Bernard? Uh, 17. Wow, okay. So why don't we begin with uh, just talking about your early years. Is Zena, you early? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Zena, you can remove the photo at this point. Yeah, tell us about your early years and where are you from and what schools did you attend? Okay, I was born in Los Angeles, uh, grew up in a neighborhood off of 66 and Western. The schools that I attended, uh, my first school was uh, Western Avenue Elementary School, got kicked out of there, went to 59th Street Elementary School, got kicked out of there, went to 74th Street School, uh, elementary school, settled down, went through there, graduated, left there, went to Horseman Junior High School. And uh, at that particular time, uh, there was a tragic event in my life where I left my, my, I lost my parents. And then I really started to go left field. So I got kicked out of Horseman Went to, John, uh, went to John Muir Junior High School, got kicked out of John Muir Junior High School, went to Bret Hart, got kicked out of Bret Hart, and I ended up in an all-boys all school for delinquents called Reese. 
after I left Reese, I, uh, I spent some time at a camp, a juvenile camp called Scott, Camp Scott, and for a charge of, it, of being incorrigible, a juvenile crime. Left Scott, and I didn't want to go to school with boy, all boys, and I had an opportunity to enroll in Crenshaw High School. I enrolled in Crenshaw High School, went to Crenshaw High School, got eventually got kicked out of there, ended up in Dorsey Continuation, and uh, that's it for the high schools I went to. Uh, after that, I went to, oh, I also went to a Catholic school, Verbum, Verbum Day uh, Catholic school after I got kicked out of there too. Uh, right after uh, my parents uh, passed away. So that was right after Horse Man, Verbum Day. Uh, and then later on in life, I went to Southwest College and El Camino College. And I spent a little time at Cerritos College and Cypress College. So let me ask you, uh, Bernard, I know you identified yourself as a non -conform. And so before your parents passed away, you, you had some difficulty in school. Do you know, can you explain why? Before? Before they uh, passed away. Uh, that's probably just an adjustment to, uh, to going to school, getting uh, acclimated to uh, elementary school. You know, uh, for some reason, uh, when I made the transition to 74th Street School, kind of settled down, got into my, my schoolwork, did pretty good, and then the start of, uh, I guess, divergent behavior through association, uh, cultural effects, uh, you know, things like that. Were your schools predominantly black? Uh, yes, except for 74th Street School. At the time, a 74th Street School was uh, right on the borderline of Inglewood and Los Angeles, okay? So we had Caucasian students in class, and where you see, see uh, us going our separate ways, but where we were getting ready to graduate, graduate. So uh, the black students went to Horseman Junior High School or something similar. The white students went to uh, Airport Junior High School. So let me ask you about Crenshaw High School because that's when, I guess you didn't really consider yourself an activist at that point, but you participated in the student walkout. What was that about? Good question. Uh, at the time, students were walking out of classes all over LA. I, um, if my memory uh, doesn't fail me, I think it originated from the BSU at Fremont High School. I'm not certain. And it was over certain issues that were happening in school. Some of the things that we were deprived of, uh, black studies and a whole lot of other issues. Uh, but I wasn't an activist Activist at that time. I was just a student. I'm sorry. You mentioned that your parents passed away when you were quite 13. young. Do you yeah, mind talking about that? Yeah, I was 13 years old. My parents passed away from a murder-suicide. Um, happened to be in the house at the time. I walked into... Uh, uh, my bedroom where my parents were and I witnessed the aftermath of the murder suicide and then I reported it to the police and the rest was history. And okay. I, I have a question. Okay, please. Um, yeah, because I was, I was going to ask you to mention that too because, you know, earlier you kept, you mentioned how many times you got kicked out of school and I wanted to know after elementary school do you think that had any impact of at it because the people listening are saying well if he just got kicked out of school got kicked out of school but that might have had an effect and you being incorrigible later and if so it might have been uh 
I noticed that the people that I was associated with as I was growing up, we were all kids. Uh, we were uh, mischievous uh, boys. Uh, I mean, we were even in the Boy Scouts at um, a Catholic school called, I mean, Catholic church called St. Anselm's. And even in the Boy Scouts, uh, we replicated uh, deviant behavior. Like we'll go to the camp for uh, a Boy Scout, like what do you call it, like jamboree or camp out. Mm -hmm. And we would intimidate other Boy Scouts with the hiking poles. We'll walk over to their camp at night and terrorize them or whatever. Uh, we were just mischievous, crazy kids. But to, at a, but to a kind of different level of mischievousness, you would say, right? Yeah, it kept, it kept progressing. You know, uh, you know um, one of my... Uh, uh, I had a conscience as, as a young kid because we actually uh, went into our school when, when uh, nobody was there and just rummaged through the classrooms and whatever and got pins and stationery and all kind of stuff, you know. I felt guilty about that and walked up to, uh, walked back up to the school and threw all the pins and whatever back over the fence and went on. So, so I, I'm, I don't think I've asked you this. Did you never had any guy gang affiliations, did you? Not directly. Uh, we would imitate uh, gang fights after Boy Scout meetings, but we were just imitating or, or, or imitating the behavior and we were play, what do you call it? Like play acting, play fighting or whatever. Uh, I kind of grew up after uh, that had settled down, you know, so that's like after the riots uh, of 1966. So gang activity uh, kind of settled down, you know. I, I, I affiliated myself or I called myself associated with the gladiators at that time but I was never really a part of it. Uh, I had relatives that were a part of it. So, Let me clarify that because younger people now might associate with Crips and Bloods when you say gangs, but you mentioned gladiators. So you grew up, you're saying you kind of grew up in the period between the end of those types of gangs and, and um, Crips and Bloods, which is when you were an activist, obviously when I came into active, activism, yeah. Mm -hmm. So may I ask, um, Bernard, how, did, how and when did you become a member of the Black Panther Party? I became a member of the Black Panther Party in 1969, and uh, I was a juvenile hall escapee. So um, I had I was sentenced to, uh, I guess, juvenile camp or YA, and they had were. We, I was I was uh, scheduled to go to the optometrist. The probation officer officer picked us up at Central Juvenile, Juvenile Hall, drove us to Boyle Heights, got our eyes examined, and uh, I broke and ran after leaving the optometrist's office. I had all this plotted out, but I didn't know exactly where I was. So once I got, uh, I guess, a little direction of where I was, I found, uh, was it Long Beach Avenue or, or whatever? Well, I found these railroad tracks and Long Beach, I believe Long Beach Avenue uh, was adjacent to the railroad tracks. So I'm walking with my juvenile hall clothes and I come across a little park adjacent to uh, Jefferson High School. And I get in a conversation, I guess, with a student at Jefferson High School. And he directed me to the office of the Black Panther Party. And I walked to 41st and Central, explained my situation. Uh, officer of the day there was Two Ray Pope. Explain my situation as a juvenile hall escapee, et cetera. 
and I got a change of clothes. I got out the juvenile hall clothes and um, I got some bus fare. And that started my relationship with the Black Panther Party. So you would say you were homeless <laughs> during that period? Uh, there You're was a period home where you were there, staying. Yeah, there was a period from that point on, I went to go live with uh, a relative in Oxnard, get out there for a while, got a little job. Uh, that played out, came back to LA, went back to the Black Panther Party, was hid out for a while at, at uh, different members' houses and whatever, and then started functioning as a, as a I guess, full-time foot soldier of the Black Panther Party. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Keith, did you have any questions? Um, I was wondering, why were you in juvenile hall for in being transferred? For, do you remember why? Why was I at juvenile hall? When you were going for the optometrist visit. Where right, right. I, I've always worn glasses and I had a lazy eye and because I'd really, I never really addressed that issue because they had a way for you to train or strengthen your eye. I never followed through. So I always wore glasses. So when I was sitting at, um, at Juvenile Hall, I had already knew that I was going to the optometrist before, before being shipped to, uh, to the you know, juvenile facility where I would serve my time. You know, uh, but at that time, I was already uh, politically indoctrinated from spending time at the Old County Jail in the juvenile team. Indoctrinated into the movement? In that political thought, yeah. Okay. Karen, you have it? Dr. Well, I just wanted to say when you were being indoctrinated, I think during one of our previous conversations, you mentioned the um, you learned from the Steiner brothers who were part of the US organization. This is Malana Karinga's organization, right? That's incorrect. Oh, OK, please. Yeah, I learned from a brother named Wendell. OK. It just so happens that the Steiner brothers who were charged with the death of uh, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins at UCLA, they were in a module or a tank behind us. They were segregated, okay? But they were able to have influence on the juveniles uh, with their cultural nationalism uh, through just talking or sending kites uh, from one cell to another. Uh, and so they had an influence I guess on everybody, but I was more indoctrinated by this brother that was named, whose name was Wendell, and he was more uh, of a political activist. And he had a confrontation where the, uh, with the police where he was wounded uh, from shotgun wounds. So he made a major uh, influence on me, uh, on my mindset at the time. Okay, so Walter Ture Pope was really important to your, I would yeah. say, development and then Wendell, politically. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so do you mind if we just kind of move forward and talk a little bit about the SWAT attack on the uh, Panther headquarters? And I, and I, one of the reasons why I think it's important that we talk about that is this is because since uh, the film came out, Judas and the Black Messiah, there's been a lot of conversation, right, about what happened to Fred Hampton and Mark Clark and the others in Chicago. What most people don't know is that four days later, the LAPD and SWAT attempted the same kind of attack on the headquarters in Los Angeles. I think Fred Hampton was assassinated before we were attacked. Right, four days before. So and after, and after that, uh, Fred Hampton, Fred Hampton died before the attack. Right, I December fourth. Yeah. Right, and then December eighth was the attack Correct. on Los Angeles, and so it seems that it was a pre-dawn raid both times, early in the morning, and the attack was on the ship. 
in the offices of the leadership. So I'm hoping that we can kind of talk about what happened in LA, which was very similar to what happened in Chicago. The difference, of course, was that you guys were appeared you guys were prepared for that attack. Uh, yeah, we had the leadership of Geronimo Pratt who was a decorated uh, Vietnam veteran. Uh, I think he spent two tours in Vietnam. From his experience uh, and his leadership, he prepped that building for uh, any oncoming uh, uh, attack. At that particular time, the green light was given to uh, uh, the police to actually murder and assassinate uh, Black Panthers. And I think LA region, we had, uh, I think we had one of the most people murdered by uh, LAPD and the police. Uh, matter of fact, it was a week before the shootout that they tried to assassinate me before the event even happened. And if it wasn't for, uh, there was an elderly lady that made her presence known as a witness, I would have been assassinated and I wouldn't have been able to participate in that, uh, in that event. But on the day, uh, on that particular day, uh, I ended up at 41st and Central because I was working out of the, the Watts office uh, on Anzac. And they needed some people to help with some work at central office. And I happened to, uh, to grab a ride to central office and I was there. Um, I wanna give homage to a, a brother that we buried yesterday, Gil Parker, uh, who, who passed away just recently. Anyway, um, it started off, I was standing on uh, security on the top of the roof. Gil Parker relieved me from my security post and I went into the building, uh, into the library to get some sleep. Uh, when the attack started, Gil Parker was uh, captured they used him as a human shield behind SWAT and shot, shot down into the building. Uh, and they also tortured him on top of the roof. You know, um, anyway, it, uh, the shootout began, began uh, where from the location of where I was at, uh, there was a library and there was a main uh, room with a skylight and the police originally started shooting down from the roof into uh, into the into the you know uh, into the room into the second floor where where I was at and everybody else at, was at on the second floor uh, we returned fire eventually they got off the roof they planted explosives uh, assuming that the roof will collapse. Uh, from my understanding, it was a, an explosive that the fire department used called AWACS or something. Uh, but their, their theory didn't work. Uh, it made some holes in the roof, but the roof didn't collapse. And that led the way, uh, that's how the shootout began on the second floor. Uh, uh, there are other Panthers that can describe what happened on the first floor. On the second floor, uh, we were pretty much pinned down. Um, remember, our building was reinforced. There was sand in the walls. There were sandbags behind the sand in the walls. This was a brick building. And across the street on Central Avenue were snipers. So you couldn't really return fire from the second floor. We didn't have any bunkers or anything. Okay. So I, our job was uh, you had 
the SWAT team members or whatever were trying to make entry into the front door. And we were armed with uh, pipe bombs. So the people on the first floor would yell up to us on the second floor, uh, communicate to us that they were trying to make entry. And uh, that's when we would light the pipe bombs from out the window onto the, onto, uh, onto the ground and um, they would retreat. Okay, can we show the video and then come back? Are we ready for that, Zena? Yes, I can do that. Can okay. Okay. Thank you. The sounds of early morning of this particular morning in a black section of Los Angeles. A shootout at the headquarters of the Black Panther Party. Hundreds of police moved into the area, sealing it off, ordering a school closed for the day, advising businessmen not to open at all. It began when officers armed with warrants went to the headquarters before dawn to search for weapons. They were met with gunfire. Three policemen were cut down. All are now listed in satisfactory condition. Despite repeated bullhorn orders to surrender, the eight men and three women inside held out for more than four hours. Then, one by one, they did surrender. Three had been wounded, two men and a woman. It was the first real test for the men of the Special Weapons and Tactics Group, the SWAT Squad, as it's called. Every member has a marksman's rating. They have sniper rifles, M14s, and some use the high-velocity M16, as in Vietnam. The police say they've had a series of incidents involving the Panthers recently, the latest a few nights ago, when an officer was ordered out of the Panther headquarters at gunpoint. And so, last night, after notifying the FBI and Governor Ronald Reagan, the officers went out with search warrants looking for a machine gun believed to be owned by one of the Panthers. More than a dozen persons were arrested at a home and a Panther office a few miles away. But at the headquarters, the street became a battleground. Hundreds of rounds were fired, the police say mostly from inside the building. The sidewalk was covered with bloodstains, spent cartridges, and broken glass. And when it was over, 11 more Panthers were in custody. Three officers were in the hospital. The neighborhood reeked with the smell of tear gas and fear. And an old man came out to clear a path through the rubble of violence. Two hours after the shootout, when the gas fumes had cleared, a look at the Panther Fortress, and it was that, complete with sandbags and gun ports facing onto the street. More blood stains and an arsenal, not a small arsenal either. There were two submachine guns, three sawed-off shotguns, six handguns, a dozen rifles and carbines. The office has its own loading bench for ammunition. Police officials say they went to the headquarters heavily armed because of the Panther literature, which exhorts them to abide by the essays of their imprisoned Minister of Defense, Huey Newton. The main theme, according to the police, in all that literature is violence directed at lawmen. A few blocks away, a crowd gathered on a street corner, and a force of officers moved in there, too. There were rocks and bottles thrown, there were scuffles and some arrests. Obviously, the area is tense, but there has been no further violence. All from the engines, welcome the pilgrims, and to the buffaloes, who once rule a plane. Like the vultures, circling beneath the dark clouds, looking for the rain. Looking for the rain Just like the city That stagger on the coastline And a nation That just can't stand much more Like the forest Buried beneath the highway Never had a chance to grow Never had a chance to grow And now it's winter Winter in America Yes, and all of the hills Have been killed Away. Yeah, but the people know, the people 
know it's winter Winter in America Can I get a copy? <laughs> yeah. I never seen that before. We just found it online. Uh, oh, okay. And Ali, Ashley did a little editing. The perspective might be a little different than what you would uh, yeah. say um, in terms of the commentary. I think he got a question. Who had a question? Well, had you had you been prepared for that prior to the assassination of, of Fred Hampton? Or did that come about to be so well prepared um, after that, like in those few days? Yeah, mentally uh, we were prepared. I mean, they've been they were killing us all over LA, you know. So uh, we knew that our lives were endangered. Uh, we had, uh, I guess, gun safety training. You know, um, I never had any training on firing or the, you know, the, the, the instructions on how to use a weapon. Uh, I learned how to clean weapons, uh, but other than that, and I stood security. I mean, everybody stood post at that time uh, uh, in the Black Panther Party uh, because we were aware that we were vulnerable of being under attack. And um, we had, according to the constitution, uh, uh, second amendment rights, you know, uh, and, and the, the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So our mindset was uh, uh, kind of prepared. Uh, my mindset was kind of um, prepared for it. I mean, they had just tried to assassinate me a week prior to the shootout. So, um, it was, uh, we had a lot of dedication to uh, what we were trying to uh, uh, do was serve the community. That was just one aspect that was in, in, in self-defense, you know, but uh, if you want to get down to nitty gritty was, uh, uh, what do you call it? Winning hearts and minds mm -hmm. was the service to the community um, and the uh, free breakfast programs that were not in effect until we started them. Uh, the free medical clinics, getting doctors to address some of the medical issues of the community, uh, a lot of things. And uh, the political coalitions that we made, like with the Brown Berets and, and um, the Young Lords. Uh, uh, you know, all that made uh, uh, an impression, you know, uh, upon me and my, my, my mental state. And then you got to consider all the different liberation struggles that were going on at the time. You know, uh, we had the effects of the Tupamaros in, uh, in uh, Latin America, uh, South Africa, uh, the African struggle. I think there was a struggle going on in Zimbabwe at the time. Uh, so all those things had an effect on us. Can Karen, does he have time? Dr. Stan, I'm sorry. Yes. Can you briefly explain about the assassination attempt by the police on him? Does he? Do we have time? Oh, sure, we do. And then we can open it up after that. I like the fact that, uh, Bernard, that you really talked about the programs, the daily work, selling the newspapers, um, the breakfast program, free, free medical care, the free clothing um, uh, programs that you had. So I think that's great. But sure, go ahead. Uh, what was your question, Keith? Well, can you explain briefly how they tried to assassinate you? You just kind of mentioned it. Okay, I'll, I'll do it real quick. Uh, I was working out the Watts office. Uh, keep in mind that I was a, a juvenile escapee. And me and... Uh, a Black Panther offer, uh, officer, uh, Jimmy Johnson. We left the Anzac Community Center, went to 103rd Street, where we were intercepted by two police police officers 
One was Notorious, whose nickname was Cigar. Uh, they put us in the police car, drove us to 77th police station. They kept him, didn't do any investigation on me or they would have found out I was an escapee. Put me back in the car, drove me to 103rd Street where the railroad tracks was, was a big vacant lot and a tailor shop. Then they then they uh, proceeded on, on uh, uh, you know brutalizing me, beating me. When they got finished with that, they told me to run. And this was like about 3 a.m. in the morning. It was late at night. There happened to be an elderly woman who was driving down 103rd Street that stopped, that saved my life on that day by making her presence known. Otherwise I would have been dead. Um, even after the beating, they drove up on the sidewalk trying to get me to run and, and they would stop and, you know, they, they would rev their engine and stop and rev their engine and stop all down 103rd Street, early morning in the hours. And after they got finished with all their little uh, tactics, uh, the lady got me in her car drove me to the community center, uh, then I went and got medical treatment. Had that had that lady not saved you, how, how would that how would that story have been reported the next morning? I'd probably been dead. And they would have made up something to justify their actions? I'm pretty sure they would. Dr. Stanford? Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask Dr. Um, Glocke, are you ready for us to open it up for questions? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Should, um, how do you want to do this? Raise their hands and you, how do you normally do your classes? Do they yeah, just speak out? If anyone, they... has a, if anyone has a question, you want to just raise your hand uh, so that we can identify who it is? And this is your opportunity, so ask away. And Hi, I, oh, sorry. Um, I couldn't find how to raise my hand, but <laughs> I have a question. Um, you had mentioned on the video, they had mentioned that uh, the police had had several warrants to um, go to the um, Black Panther headquarters. And um, I just wanted to know what was his warrants for? Because I believe they had said something about um, something pertaining to violence, but they didn't actually mention it. You want me to answer that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just asking, like, <laughs> what was their justification for going to the head of the I wouldn't know. They had justification for, any, for, for anything and, uh, like they do today. <laughs> uh uh. I have no idea. Well, you know what? Um, so the book that I did or the work that I did with your comrade Wayne Farr, and my understanding is that it was a no-knock warrant. And so when people think about Breonna Taylor and the no-knock warrant, that's exactly what happened. They said they had a no-knock warrant to um, uh, arrest someone, I think, anyway, I think his name was George Young, and who wasn't there, if, that, if I recall that. And so they did not, they just barged in. Exactly. And then they, the Panthers started shooting and three of them got shot. And so they ran out. That's a brief description, yeah. Yes, you can tell <laughs> so more, but yes, no knock warrants. So these no knock warrants aren't, aren't new. But you gotta consider it also they changed the gun laws in reference to black people owning guns because of the demonstration at uh, in Sacramento when they passed uh, what was it Muford Act? Mm -hmm. uh, you know they put uh, uh, like a restraint on our constitutional rights. If we're being brutalized and murdered all over the country. Uh, uh, 
and we we have the right to bear arms in protection of ourselves. And they, they change the rules of the game uh, uh, and change the gun laws. I mean, that's a significant uh, significant in itself. What were you thinking about during the shootout? Because it lasted how long? Uh, four and a half, five hours. Five hours. Exactly. And this was the first time that SWAT was used. SWAT, exactly. most people would argue, was put together for organizations such as yours. And there were 300 members of SWAT and LAPD outside, and there were 11 of you in the house. So what were you thinking while you were in this house? <laughs> I was thinking about survival. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> That's why I, I, the majority of uh, those four hours, I spent huddled up against some sandbags. You know, uh, actually, uh, you know, looking up at the ceiling, if they're going to shoot back down through the ceiling. I did go downstairs on one occasion, and they were trying to make entry, and I was in the middle. I guess of uh, the, uh, I guess of the runway or the entrance to the to uh, to the building, and they were trying to make another entry. And you got to remember, I'm 17 years old. That's the first time I ever shot a gun, and it happened to be that I had an automatic shotgun. Okay, and there were two bunkers in front of me, and there was a door. And uh, I think Wayne was in one bunker. And I might, I might be mistaken. I think Roland was in another bunker. But I know they was Roland. Roland had criticized me because when they, um, when the police tried to gain re-entry or entry, uh, I let off with the shotgun, and the shotgun has a spread. Okay, so I'm endangering my comrades, you know, because I don't know that you know the spread you know, a, of a shotgun. And if I could remember correctly, that we used to load the shotgun with bird shot, slug, bird shot, and then, you know, like that same continuous pattern. So uh, I guess when the bird shot was fired, there was a spread and they can feel the effects. I don't think I hit anybody, but I was warned that, that uh, that particular weapon that I was using um, had a spread to it. Well, I have. A, does anyone have a question? I do. I got a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was there any kind of conversations going on in the building between you and your comrades? Yeah, uh, there were conversations of uh, of where the police were at. They were communicate to the second floor. Uh, there's conversations about ammunition. Uh, and eventually there was a conversation about uh, surrendering in the end when the ammunition was uh, about to run out. Uh, but we were, it was stuck in our mind that uh, they were trying to kill us and nobody wanted to go outside. You know, I mean, if you weren't gonna die, uh, it was, you want to die defending yourself to the last man. Uh, eventually, uh, it was Peaches that uh, initiated the surrender. And I, I don't know. I think they got a hold of the press on the phone. But uh, Peaches was the first uh, young woman that, that, that left the building with the white handkerchief and that initiate, initiated the surrender. There's a question a uh, student Larry wrote. It says, do you believe the video gave a good description of the shootout and the events happening in the area during the aftermath? So maybe what was it like when you surrendered? Uh, it took us, put us in the police car and uh, I believe they took us to uh, the, what was it? They used to call it the glass house. In, oh. in, in Los Angeles, uh, so we were we were in custody. Uh, the aftermath, there are people still living that were in the community at the time that can describe the aftermath. 
Any other questions? Did you, um, so you get, you're arrested and you go to jail. Do you get bailed out? What happens after that for you? Okay, you got to, uh, remember I'm a juvenile. Oh, uh, and you're yeah. in an AP too, aren't you? Yeah, so uh, they take me to juvenile hall. In juvenile, in Central Juvenile Hall, they have one section for extreme crimes like one I was charged with. So I was housed there for a moment, went to court, and I had uh, asked the judge to be tried as an adult. You know, uh, they have a proceeding for that. The judge had no problem in, 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 in um, letting me be judged as an adult, okay? So uh, when, I, when I was declared to be tried as an adult, I was sent to the old county jail and they still had to separate you. And I was in the juvenile tank once again uh, for that particular crime, for those charges rather. Okay, Tammy Cardona, or I think it's Tammy Cardona, you have a question? <laughs> Yeah, I, I was just wondering, kind of along those same lines as Larry, uh, you know, obviously the, the spin of the press at the time is not necessarily reflective of the whole picture. And I something that stuck out to me in there was one of their justifications was um, literature. They said that the Black Panther Party had in relation to uh, espousing or focusing on violence toward uh, the police. Uh, what would your opinion of the literature they could be discussing be? Like, wh what in your um, mind would be what they construed as only just violence directed at the police? Uh, okay, uh, we had we had the newspaper, the Black Panther Party newspaper, and. One of, uh, I guess, a tactic is dehumanizing your enemy. Just like they dehumanize us as a people, we dehumanize uh, the police or police agencies as pigs. Uh, and we described, in reality, the things they were doing in the community. You know, I mean, it was uh, it was no problem for them to to beat people, to have murdered people justifiably. Uh, we're going through a trial now where the whole world witnessed uh, the execution of a man on video. Nine minutes, uh, 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 that policeman went crazy. You know, so it's nothing new. You know, it's just that we were operating under, actually we were operating under the Constitution of the United States. We were operating under the laws of the United States. It's just that they never apply to black people as a whole and uh, it never really applied to a lot of uh, minorities. Yeah. You know, uh, they always had the right to execute you on the spot. And matter of fact, they still do and can cover it up. Thank you. Uh, Dean Searcy has a question. Yes, thank you. And thank you for sharing your, your story. My question is more so about the aftermath with you and, and the Panthers. So I am making the assumption that after that shootout, you had been more politicized and um, and activated in in your desire to align more in it with the Black Panthers. However, I know within about 1973 of, of sorts is that the Black Panthers started to lose a little bit of their political might and imagination, capturing the imagination of the people. So I'm going to keep this short. Part of this is I'm finishing a biography of Curtis Mayfield. And I've talked to a lot of people and they say that 
when Superfly came out in 1973, that's what led to the end of the Black Power movement and it, it ushered in another era. So I'm, I'm putting all this together is that to me, you're at 17, shootout, you were going to be Black Panther to put it in, in the terms of the late 90s, early 2000s, you were gonna be ride or die forever, Black Panther. And so, but 1973 happened. So, and then I, my understanding of history is that the, the movement started to kind of taper and the, once again, you I'm using your term and the military term of capturing the hearts and the minds, but then that imagination seemed to, to founder a bit. Um, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, J. Edgar Hoover. What's the name of that program? Co COINTEL or something? The Counterintelligence yeah. Program of the FBI. Right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so we were we were targeted for destruction, and one some of the ways of uh, how they destroy. Uh, positive movement in the community. They flood the community with drugs. Um, they, I guess in cinematography, they might exalt uh, the life of a hustler or a pimp, you know. Uh, you know, uh, that was his means. I mean, growing up in the black community, one of the first books I read was uh, Iceberg Slim. Okay, I read that novel from cover to cover and tried to put that theory into practice and come to find out there was the Gorilla Pimp and there was the Mac. And the Mac was more persuasive because he captured the mind. And the Gorilla Pimp could only control a woman through brutal force. You know, what kind of example is that? You know, and you know, the, the, the um, having money, cars, and stuff like that. So, so they, they put those attractions on how people survive in, in, in the black community, those negative things they'll bring out and the positive things. One of the things I noticed, because I lived in Latin America, I lived in Puerto Rico, and I can, I, I can identify with Latin culture, but I can identify with Latin culture as it pertains to me as a, a, a part of the African uh, diaspora, okay? And in the music, I love the music. I love salsa, I love merengue, I love kumba, uh, kumbia, uh, I love bomba. And bomba it was a resistance music to uh, oppression, slaves, okay? Now, fast forward, we got music in the industry that, uh, uh, I mean, it puts down women, you know, it promotes this gangster lifestyle. Gangster who? You know, majority of the gangsterism is negative and that goes against the growth of the community, you know. And still to this day, you have music, and I was listening to some today, that uh, exonifies the, 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 the women the black queen in the music, you know, uh, and life, you know, uh, we, we even like we trace a lot of our history for your music, you know, um, sheesh. I mean, I, sometimes I wonder of all the diaspora uh, that we hear in, in, in the United States, have been, uh, I mean, I mean, we, I mean, they did a real good job on us. Out of all the people that were brought over under slavery, they did a, a fantastic job of cutting us off to our roots, uh, our history. Uh, I mean, it's amazing, man. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, I mean, we're supposed to be the in the information age, and uh, I mean, we're still doing shit that's left field. And it's sad. So I just wanted to say uh, before we continued, uh, Dr. Glocka, you may want to announce the survey. 
Yeah. Do you want me to uh, send it to the students? You want me to? Can we put it in the chat and have? Them? Oh yes, Zena has it. Okay. Zena. Uh, Dr. Tamford would like everyone to um, fill out the survey. So if you could either, uh, hopefully, she'll be able to put it in the the link or in the chat. So if you can click on it and maybe start filling it out now, or click on it and fill it out soon, uh, that would be great. Great. So, you know, I wanted to just say, because I know that, you know, there's a lot of conversation, too, about some of the internal problems in the occur in the party. I don't know if that's what you were, were getting at, Dean Searcy, um, some of that discussion. And that takes me back to Bernard, because you, my understanding is that, well, you dropped out, you dropped out. Oh, okay. So there was a trial. Um, all the Panthers, there were 18 of them because not only was the Panther headquarters attacked, but two other Panther offices in LA were attacked at the same time that same morning. And I don't know if you have, um, Zena, the photo of the victors, so we can show that. So Geronimo Pratt's home was attacked that morning around 5 a.m., and so was the Walter Ture Pope Community Center, which was a Panther office. So all of these people went on trial after that night. And so I just wanted you to see those folks. And so what happens is there's a two year trial. It was considered at that time, one of the most expensive, you can down now, Zena, um, one of the most expensive and the Panthers were found not guilty. They were charged with attempted murder against police officers. Two years later, they were all found not guilty. So the community recognized that they had been attacked. There was no attack on the police officers, but there was an attack on the Panthers. But Bernard, why don't you tell your story? Because you did not go on trial, right? I initially went on trial. Oh, okay, you did. Okay. Okay, I initially went on trial. Uh, I, caught, I got called to the underground, went to the underground for, for some years, uh, left the underground, and I went to Puerto Rico uh, and uh, lived in Puerto Rico for a while, uh, got in contact with my family. My family didn't know anything was going on, called my family from Puerto Rico, and uh, mm -hmm. They arranged for me to come back into the continental United States and resolve my uh, legal issues. Okay, this might be a difficult question, but you know I have to ask. What is the underground? The underground is uh, bringing it, uh, following, following the example of uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, in modern day, uh, the underground would be a safe house where you would go and stay. Uh, you might have some munitions there at that safe house. Uh, you will have a contact person that will bring you food, groceries, or whatever. But basically, you just stayed in that house. You know, eventually you would resurface. So uh, you might go in as a radical, but you'll come out. Uh, impersonating Uncle Tom or bourgeoisie, uh, you resurface as you blend in, you know, uh, you might, you get a different identity and uh, you go to work uh, and uh, you do what you do in the underground. And so after all that, you become a successful real estate agent. Yeah. And how does that happen? Considering the trauma of your early years, uh, the trauma of being a Black Panther Party member, how did you, would you say reshape or I don't know what you, I don't know what you would call it, but how did okay. your life change okay. when, you become the successful real estate agent? Uh, when I came back into, uh, into the community, uh, all that was left for me was to either um, continue on, along the lifestyle that was happening in the community. You know, there were drugs in the community. 
a um, lot of negative things. It was hard to find a job, all the natural things, you know. Uh, to make a long story short, um, I got the solution to that particular aspect by going to the Nation of Islam. So I went to the Nation of Islam. I got a business um, foundation and a desire to go back to school. So by working in the businesses, I saw an example of how current commerce was. I was a member of the fish crew where we actually took a product, went to different communities. We went to Hispanic communities, we went to Caucasian communities. All this with a truck that said Muhammad's fish on the side of it. And we're able to generate that black dollar or generate income that came back to the community. And we had one brother that was a member of the fish crew. He, he was such a good salesman. He knew where the money was in each different community. You know, so that gave me a foundation. Um, then eventually I went to, I went to uh, Southwest Junior, I mean, uh, Southwest College. Uh, went to Southwest College and majored in uh, psychology. Uh, went through that. Uh, and then I changed my major because I needed to make some money, you know. And um, I changed my major to real estate. And I took the real estate classes. I prepped myself for um, the courses. Uh, eventually, I took the real estate test. It was back in 19... 81 that um, I passed my test. Then I started my real estate career and uh, went from there. And my understanding is that you worked with other, was it other Panthers or just one, you guys, because many of you had to be independent because of your backgrounds. And so you became entrepreneurs. That might've been some of their stories. My story, my story goes, you know, uh, a little bit different. Um, I was blessed with a good job through a referral. Uh, I worked at a company called Alcoa Aluminum. And at, at, at Alcoa Aluminum, I worked my way up to uh, different positions. But it's, at that particular time, is one of those high paying industrial jobs in the community those jobs have left the community, but I had that. And uh, when I got my real estate license, I volunteered for graveyard so I can function as a full-time agent. You know, uh, I can get my, my rest when I could in the daytime, but I can do something that would uh, uh, generate business in the daytime, you know? Um, so it, it was, a uh, uh, how would I describe it? I had an obsession, you know. I had an obsession to buy my first property. And because of the mindset of a lot of people around me that I work with, a lot of people don't want to share knowledge, you know. I had an obsession to buy my first property. And I bought my first property in a way that uh, um, wasn't, wasn't, all right, I had to use somebody else to uh, to uh, to get the property for me, okay? And I had put up the money. But if I had known better in my early years in real estate, there was a better way of doing it. You know, at that time, uh, I was laid off from Alcoa Aluminum almost three years. You know, I was living in Orange County and thank God I was living in Orange County because there's a lot of different jobs I can get, you know, to, to, uh, to, to tie me over. But when I came back to, uh, off a of layoff, uh, I had um, this high, high income, as far as I was concerned, that I was making there. Uh, and I had the ability, and I had um, started, I had started in Cerritos, made my way back to LA and that's when my uh, my my career took off. You know, I had to learn oh, go ahead, please. You go ahead. 
No, I'm sorry. So I was going to say it's interesting. So you were a minor, so your record didn't follow you like some of the others. Would that be yeah, the majority of anything, uh, majority I was accused of, uh, I mean, encourageable is not an adult crime. Encourageable is a, is a juvenile crime. And that was the only thing they had me on. It's just that I was influenced by my uh, association. Okay. You know, and I even even to even as an adult, I can see the negative aspects by associating with different people that are negative people. They might be good in certain ways, but uh, they're negative. There's a negative side, and if you follow down that road, I mean, it could hinder your career or whatever. You know, so you have to stand on your own foundation. Well, my final question is just when you look looking back, what was the impact of the of that movement or the work that you did? What do you what do you think about it today? I think about um, there are times when uh, people have have thanked me for my uh, contribution. Uh, I actually met. Uh, one of the kids I was feeding, you know, as they were on their way to school, you know, they're adults now, you know, they remember that. Uh, different things, you know, uh, just uh, uh, to be separated from uh, a lot of those people and to go full circle and to, uh, and to meet up with them in my senior years, uh, that's a much higher power than me. You know, um, so it was, uh, Andy, and you think that we were kids. I mean, we were kids. You know, matter of fact, the civil rights movement, kids was on the front line. Mm -hmm. uh, when you describe it as a black power movement, kids were on the front line. It was the youth that put it together, you know, um, and that we were able to make people or businesses accountable in the community to give something back to the community because the donations came from, I would go to UCLA, got donations from UCLA for the breakfast program. Uh, I got donations from uh, stores in the community. You know, uh, those kids got fed every morning. So that was like a, uh, what do you call it? A service of giving something back, you know, and our kids are, are uh, they're babies. You know, so we got to deal with our kids, but we got to educate and love our kids in a certain way. Uh, so those were community uh, uh, experiences that were positive, that left an impact on society because the government wasn't doing it. They're doing it now. You know, right. so, so uh, those were impact, you know, those were examples of uh, uh, of what we did. And it was surprising enough that there was a, a city councilman that gave us, uh, uh, I guess, commutations at City Hall for the work that we did in the community. And uh, uh, so we took, I took pictures uh, of that event and uh, that was amazing. First they were trying to, government was trying to kill us and now they're giving us awards, but uh, there was a brother, there was a, there was a, I forgot his name. I wish I could remember. He's still a counselor. And uh, I guess, um, I think uh, Gregory Everett might have had something to do with it too. But we got uh, awards um, for service to the community. Well, thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Bernard Arafat, for spending this time with us today. We learned a lot. Um, I'm sure that our professor will take some of this information back, discuss it with her students, um, talk more about uh, the work back then connected to today. And we really appreciate you sharing, sharing some difficult experiences, but also some that were very enlightening um, as well. So we appreciate you. Yeah, thank That's you for right. having me. Thank you, Bernard. Thank, thank you. you very much.